Well, I ask you a question. I want to ask you a question this morning. When is the last time you had your eyes checked? You know, if you've gone to the eye doctor or your optometrist, ophthalmologist, you know what that's like, right? You, you get there in the office and you sit down in a darkened room in a comfortable chair and you take off the glasses or take out your contacts that you're wearing and he puts the, a, a, an eye chart up. And you know what that looks like. It starts with a big, big letter. And you're supposed to read line by line and tell them what letter that you see. You know, if you're like me, that first letter is the easiest. And you go down the next line, and I usually get that one right. And then the next line, and I start squinting. And by the end of that line, I'm, I'm usually guessing. <laughs> and what happens is you continue guessing, and you think, is he going to say anything or not? You know, he just lets you keep on, and it's like he's trying to see what, what you see, but he doesn't really tell you if you're getting it right or not. And uh, so uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. And then he puts this uh, weird gadget on your face, right, with the little, it's like goggles, except a lot bigger. And uh, he, he says two, he asks two questions, better one, better two. And he's changing the lens every time he does that. Better one, better two. And at a point, I just like, I don't know. Just give me some glasses. <laughs> and I, and, but, but you have to choose, right? You have to choose. Else you go home with the wrong prescription. And that's certainly not, not good, especially if you spend money on a pair of glasses, right? So you want to get it right. And I thought, you know how important it is for us in our physical side, as important as it is physically to see right, it is much more important to see spiritually correct. And so when we lose sight of Jesus, here's the thing, we lose sight of life itself. And so we're looking at, for example, something that maybe the author of Hebrews tells us when we're talking about living in the culture that we're living in now, he tells us, he says, run with endurance the race God has set before us. And how do you do that? He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And so we have to keep our eyes on the one who gives life itself. If we get our eyes off Jesus, things that really turn south, don't they? Things turn bad. And so he encourages us in that way. You know, uh, several years ago, before they uh, introduced contact lenses, I may have told this story once before, but several years before they introduced contact lenses, my aunt was one of the first people in Knoxville to get a pair, and a pair of the lenses. And you know, if you were one of those people on the early adopters of contact lenses, it was years ago, obviously, but they were hard and hard to get used to. And, but she, she put them in, and she was driving down, uh, getting off Cherry Street over here in, 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 here in Knoxville, and she was pulled over by the police officer. And uh, I guess she had missed the, uh, the speed sign, and he had her roll her window down, and he said, lady, ma'am, do you know what you were doing going down this road? And she said, officer, I've got contacts. <laughs> and he said, lady, I don't care who you know, you're still getting a ticket. See, when it comes to your spiritual eyes, who you know matters a whole lot more than what you know. And so we're looking at this this morning, and here's the thing, because why is this important? Because our worldview is shaped by the ultimate role model, Jesus. And when we have our eyes on Him, things get better. And when we take our eyes off of Him, things get worse. So this is proven out even by history. I was looking at an article by a guy named Paul Capan, and he wrote for a Christian Research Institute, and an article he titled, Jesus-Shaped Cultures, How Faithful Christians Have Transformed Societies. And here's what he said. He said, across history, the ripple effects of the Jesus world voice, the root that gives rise to these moral and socially distinct fruits, can be traced. And those J-shaped, he means Jesus-shaped, those J-shaped individuals and communities, the shoots, are faithful followers of Jesus of Nazareth, who are dedicated to his saving uniqueness and resurrection power. When Jesus' followers live lives of Christian integrity, 
They will show concern for all of God's image bearers, and this will affect society. He goes on to talk about five areas of five Jesus-shaped areas or changes in, in history that happened when Jesus was taken seriously and he was imitated, and they, people lived him out as they saw Jesus in the Gospels. And uh, so here's the truth I want you to get this morning, and it's, it's this. It's seeing Jesus as he is and living out that in our life, it, it is the key to transformation. Not only for us personally, but it's the key to transformation for our culture. And we're living in a culture that needs de- desperately needs transformation. But I will tell you this, we're living or participating in churches that desperately need transformation as well. Here's the thing, J-shaped or Jesus-shaped cultures happen when they're J-shaped Christians. And so I want to talk about this morning because the more we see him, the more and closer we follow him, the more that our, our lives will change and our culture change. So this morning we're going to look and see Jesus really giving a spiritual eye test, if you will, to the people he's talking about and talking to in chapter 8 of Mark. And let's turn to that passage, Mark 8, 22 through 30, and let's just read it together. It begins, and we're reading from the ESV version. It says, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Let's pray. So Father, we're just asking you to open our eyes this morning as well. Lord, your word goes out and it doesn't return void. And we take that promise that, Lord, it will change us when we open our eyes to your word and we take it into our hearts. So Lord, by your spirit, would you do that this morning? We bow before you and we just uh, say, Lord Jesus, be exalted in this time. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me give you some context for what we're going to be going through this morning because it really kind of helps us understand what this passage is all about. See, by this time in the gospel, Jesus has been teaching uh, for probably two and a half years. He's 24 hours a day. He's been doing miracles, thousands of miracles. He has been healing and restoring and teaching about the kingdom of God. Fantastic, magnificent teaching. And now it's really it's just exam time. And so Mark, he places... A couple of miracle stories in the passage right before the one we're looking at today. In chapter 7, he talks about uh, and heals a a deaf mute. To go back and look at that at uh, 31 through 37 in chapter 7. And then at chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, he's just fed the 4,000. And this is not just, this is 4,000 men. It probably all total might have been 20,000 people out of nothing. Out of nothing. In Mark, so by he placing these two stories, these miracle stories out there, he's not only reminding us who Jesus is, but he's also, he's also helping the disciples understand their failing class. They are failing class because they're still not, under, they're not able to, uh, to grasp who Jesus really is after two and a half years. So here it is, following the 4,000, feeding the 4,000. The disciples, they are, uh, they're out in the boat, and uh, I guess it's been a little while because all they have left in the boat is a, is, a, is a loaf of bread. So they're in the boat. They're arguing about, oh, it's like, kind of like you imagine, uh, well, I don't think this is going to be enough. What are we going to do? I don't think, how much do you eat? Well, I eat more than you. You know, that kind of conversation. And Jesus turns around, and he basically says, he says, um, fellas, stop worrying about the bread. It's not about the bread. 
And he drops a sack of questions on them, one after another, because his real message so far has just not sunk in. And here's the question. He says, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you not see? Do you not hear? Do you not remember? Do you not yet understand? They were failing the test. Makes me think of, uh, you know, when I was in first grade, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but it's like we had uh, been taught one day in first grade, I think it might have been the very first day, the teacher taught on math. It's like I didn't understand a hoot of what she said. And, but we had a test, and we took the test, and the, the goal was you line up, and, and you're going to get graded. The teacher sat down in front of the classroom, and everybody lined up to get their test graded. And so pretty soon, it was me and my friend Mickey. Mickey was behind me. I was in front. And we were seeing people getting their tests marked up with this red pen. Just and, and so there was a fear that was starting to grow in our, our little hearts. And uh, I was getting ready to stand up right there and get my test graded too. And all at once, I heard this. And I looked behind me, and Mickey was laid out on the floor like this. <laughs> He was so frightened, he'd fainted. And so that, that kind of kept, well, it didn't keep me from getting my test graded, but it paused it a little while. So, so they're getting their test graded, these guys, these disciples of Jesus, and it's almost like he's saying, guys, how many baskets were left over from the feeding of the 5,000? And they're going, uh, one, two, yeah, and he said three, four, five, six, and it goes on to 12. One for each one of you guys, right? And then he says, and how many baskets were left over from the feeding of the 4,000? And, of course, they said seven. And, of course, seven is the, is the perfect number. It's the number of completion. And it's almost like, well, there was enough, wasn't there? There was enough. And Jesus is almost saying, let me just spell it out for you guys. I've got you completely covered. Do you still not get it? Do you still not understand who I am? And so... James Edward, I think, aptly comments on this verse. He says, The disciples mirror humanity at large, which is so stuck in its own world and cares that it is blind and deaf to God. You know, the wonderful thing about Jesus is, though, he doesn't leave us in our failures, does he? He doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave these disciples either in their clueless condition. He goes on, and which really kind of brings us to our text today. And it's in verses 22 through 26. We have this healing of a blind man. Interesting story. Unusual story. It's unusual in one respect, and maybe it's just this, because it's the only miracle in all the Gospels that, that occurs in progressive stages doesn't occur all at once like all the other miracles in all the other Gospels. It's, it's through repeated touches of Jesus. And it's not because of some limitation on Jesus' part. Jesus is able to do anything he wanted to. But what he's doing, he's, he's letting this miracle happen so that he can show the disciples something. It's almost like a parable. A miracle that is a parable to teach them truths about what they needed to understand. And, and uh, it, kind of an object lesson. And so what happens? The man who is has blind, is uh, he, Jesus reaches down, and he makes uh, mud and, and spits in it, and he puts that on his eyes. And it, you think about, it, why does he put spit in the dirt? He did that the same thing with, with the deaf mute. He, he put mud in, and made mud with spit and put it in his ear. I think that really reflects the spit. Is re- represents almost like the Word of God. Because out of the mouth, out of God's mouth comes the Word. So out of His Word, He puts that in our ears, and He puts it in our eyes. See, it's the Word of God that changes everything. And so He does that for this man. He puts that, that, that spit and that mud on the man's eyes, and the man opens us. And says, well, Jesus says, well, how, how was that? How, how do you see? He says, I see, but everything looks blurry. It looks like the, the men are like trees walking around. And so Jesus does that again, makes the mud, puts it on the man's eyes, and he said, how, how is it now? And the man could completely see. He says, I see everything clearly. What a miracle. What a miracle. And this whole account revolves around this idea of seeing, seeing. In fact, in the original Greek, it's interesting, eight different words are used for nine instances of 
seeing in these verses. So following this miracle, we, uh, we come to the climax of, I, I think, Mark's whole gospel. It's right in chapter 8, which is Mark's got 16 chapters. It's right in the middle. This is the climax of the gospel. It's the watershed moment of the gospel. And after this, everything goes downhill to the cross. But this is the, this is the high point. And so we need to pay attention, and I want to spend our time here because this is Peter's great confession of the, about the identity of Jesus. It's a watershed moment. So Jesus is now, I think, painfully aware that these guys who spent two and a half years are still not where they need to be in terms of understanding who he is. He spent so many hours, and still they don't get his message. And so what does he do as a result? He decides he's going to take them on a spiritual retreat. Get away from the crowds and go somewhere where I can talk to these guys, and I want to find out what they really believe. And so what does he do? He takes them and he goes from Bethsaida, where this miracle of the healing of the man's eyes occurs, straight north about 25 miles to a place that is right at the foot of Mount Hermon. He goes to the mountains for a mountain retreat. And there it would have taken probably a day's walk for them to get there. And it says on the way, this is where they talked, on the way. And so on the way, Mark tells Jesus, or Jesus kind of makes uh, the point of, of two questions that, uh, that I want us to see this morning that, that reflect two views of how people see Jesus. And the first is about how Jesus, uh, how we see Jesus in terms of our culture. And the other way is how we see Jesus personally as as believers, as his disciples. So I want us to see these. Let's call the first the Christ of popular culture, and the second the Jesus, the, the biblical Jesus, or the Bible Jesus. And so let's look at the first one, the Christ of popular culture, or the popular Jesus. And he says to this, this question, this first question, he says, who do people say I am? I mean, you guys, we've been spending two and a half years, who do people say that I am? And apparently the disciples had already been asking people because they didn't hesitate. They, they quickly answered him, and, and they said three things uh, that are here. And these are all different ideas of who Jesus appeared to be. And uh, so I want to take this. I don't want to read too much into this about how people identify Jesus, but it seems to me that their perceptions might parallel um, the thinking in our day in some ways. But let's look at it. First, people said, they, they said, some say John the Baptist and oddly enough, people were thinking that Jesus, after John has had his head cut off, they think that uh, G- he's been resurrected and uh, he's walking around again and he's now Jesus. I don't know how they would think that. That was kind of odd. But, uh, you know, what was John known for? He was known for primarily one thing, and that was to preach against sin. And so, in some sense, people, I think, today... That's how they see Jesus, isn't it? All that he is a person who is against sin, who just wants to point out what I do wrong, and he's against me, and he, he's trying to lay a guilt trip on me. And that's their only view of Jesus. He, they also go on, they say, some say Elijah to this question. Who do people say that I am? Some say Elijah, because I think we see in Scripture there are references to the fact that in the Old Testament, when Elijah is, uh, is, is mentioned, he's supposed to say, let's say he comes before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So they kind of expected him in their, in their history, in their religion. He stands out in the Old Testament, I think, uh, he's a prophet for one, but I think he stands out as a powerful prophet. And you see Elijah doing all these miracles, uh, amazing things that would... Uh, kind of get people's attention, outstanding miracles. And I think today, in some ways, this is how people view Jesus. He's just like a miracle man. They go to him when they're in trouble or they're in deep, deep problems, and they see Jesus as the one to extract them from the problems of life because he's able to do that. That's all they go to Jesus for, and that's how they see him. Oh, there's a third one he talks about. They say, he, they ask, some say one of the prophets. That's how people in the popular culture in our day or their day, he says, some say one of the prophets, and you're talking, he's, there's all kinds of prophets, but it's kind of like a statement that there, there is a view in Jesus, he's like one of the prophets, and what did the prophets do? They were the ones who spoke the word of God. They had something to say that was from God and spoke the words of God. In a similar way, I think some people see Jesus as a, as a really wise guy. 
He's got lots of good things to say that might be worth putting on the internet or writing down or, or putting in a frame to hang on our wall. But that's as far as it goes. That's how see, some people see Jesus. You know, it's interesting to me when you get to talk with people personally, privately, uh, what they say they believe. And sometimes it can be <laughs> really way off the map. In our day, in our churches, um, I think there are churches who claim to be Christian, but they are far, and I mean really far, away from the Jesus of the Bible. And it's kind of amazing to me how people in churches and, and even pastors can, can make statements about Jesus that don't reflect Jesus whatsoever. And what happens? They make it harder for people who really do want to know who Jesus is to find him. Um, recently, I was, uh, I think this past week, I was listening to uh, Ted Huckabee on uh, his show, and he was talking in one of his opening monologues about uh, a well-known pastor who, sta- he said, uh, who stated he wouldn't or shouldn't be, we shouldn't be preaching about the infallibility or authority of the Bible because it might be offensive to non-believers. I was like, What? And so he goes, goes on, he said, uh, the pastor said, we ought to just focus on the resurrection and the love of God. Does that sound familiar? Common message, but it leaves a whole lot of the gospel out. He said, the same pastor was soft peddling the Bible's teaching on human sexuality and essentially said that sexual deviancy, deviancy didn't really matter that much. We had more important things to talk about, and we ought to give our attention to other sins. <laughs> Huckabee ended that little monologue by saying this. He says, it didn't sound like he gave any attention to any kind of sin. So our beliefs, I think, can be distorted by lots of things. They can be distorted or they can be inadequate when we see Jesus, even us as Christians. So how does that happen? Well, one of the things is by the people you hang out with. You spend time with people that, uh, that, that kind of influence the way you think, sometimes subtly, imperceptibly, Uh, we can begin to think that way too. Or maybe because of the world's value system. The Bible says don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Uh, Or maybe because simply of bad teaching. How many churches don't teach from the Bible? All they do is get up and give a a little uh, sermonette for Christianettes. Kind of the idea of just nothing that's taught from the Scriptures. And what we try to do here is take you through the Scriptures Verse by verse, if we can, expository preaching, so that you'll hear the Word of God and not our opinion. And so, uh, bad teaching, maybe that's how we get distorted or inadequate about Jesus. Or sometimes it's because we get hurt in churches, and it makes us feel a certain way, and we hold back, and it distorts our thinking, so that we don't live out the teachings of Jesus. We hold on to things because we've been hurt so badly. Or maybe simply this, is we just don't like what we see in this person named Jesus. And then what happens? We fail to be true disciples, and our culture gets worse and worse. The church begins to look just like the culture, so that the culture says, why should we listen to them? They're no different than us. And you probably heard the saying, haven't you? Perception is reality. Perception is reality. And I just wonder if our perception of Jesus, our popular perception of Jesus, is for us reality. And how much is that the case? Because it's all over the the place. Here's the thing. If we admit that we're just possibly even 10%, 10 degrees off from the Jesus of Scripture, what does that do? What happens? To that degree, we become an adversary to God's mission in the world. Because Jesus gives us his mission, and it's accurate, and it's true, and it's on target. If we're off just a little bit, we begin to deviate from what the truth is, and it gets us in places that we don't want to be. So here we have this problem. It's it's a little bit like wearing somebody else's glasses, right? I mean, i got a pair of glasses on. If you ever ever had a need where you didn't have your glasses, right, and you go, "Uh, can I borrow you? In fact, Kat, you've got some glasses on, I see right there. So I'll give these back to you. So here are Kat's glasses. Then I put Kat's glasses on. How do those look? (laughs) Honestly, I can't see 
because I have both contacts and glasses on. <laughs> but that's a little bit like putting on the world's view instead of the Bible's view of Jesus. And it's so easy to do. It's convenient. You know, over the centuries, um, a lot of so-called Bible scholars have argued that the Jesus we read in the Scriptures is not the Jesus of history. And so they have, over numbers of years, have tried to, to uh, communicate and, and convince others that the biblical Jesus is not the real Jesus. And uh, it led to a series of, of quests for um, really seeking to identify the real historic Jesus. It's probably not the Jesus of the Bible, they say. And that was a pretty famous uh, series of quest studies um, in New Testament circles called the Quest for the Historical Jesus. Started in the 19th century, and I think in some respects still going on today. But as far back as the 19th century, uh, Albert Schweitzer criticized these kinds of, this kind of thinking, and he said they're recreating Jesus in their own image. Now, I wish we had time to look at all the instances of these so-called researchers, so-called Bible scholars who have adopted and tried to, they've thrown out portions of Scripture because they didn't like what they read about Jesus, and they would say, well, that's not the real, the real text. The real text is this because it's more comfortable for me to, to listen to. So here's the thing. When, Jesus will always offend you at some level. Our, our, our sensibilities, Jesus upsets our thinking because we're not perfect like he is. We're sinners saved by grace, and so we're flawed at some level. But he's saving us. He's making us like him, but he, we're not there yet. And so there is off, often places in our lives where we think, I don't, I don't like that, what I read in Scripture. Well, that's good for you. It's good for me because it adjusts our thinking and it causes us to transform. That's called sanctification. And so um, what happens when we, when we let that happen and we don't, we don't pay attention to that as Christians? Well, the gospel no longer becomes the gospel. It's no longer the gospel, and it doesn't save anyone. What a deception. Another example. Uh, our legal system. You know, if you know history, you know it was built on Judeo-Christian values. And the principles, Jesus said, the scriptures are all about him. And uh, so something that, that, that popped up on my computer login screen this morning, I just thought how interesting this is. Let me see if you kind of get the, the gist of it and see if you pick up on it. This is subtle. And it read this, this was, as I was logging in my screen, it said, Microsoft's Justice Reform Initiative is helping shift from enforcement to care. Let me read it again. Microsoft's Justice Reform Initiative is helping shift from enforcement to care. Do you, what the, you understand what they're getting at? Uh, who's, who's got a Bible? Let me borrow just a second. Um, I ought to have a Bible up here, shouldn't I, right? Uh, the Word of God speaks to law, and it speaks against lawlessness. This is a champion of lawlessness and, and chaos. They're saying that we would not prefer to have law enforcement going on. We just want to love on people. And see how that turns out for society. Here's what Paul says. In Romans 13, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. God has put in society parameters guidelines, guardrails, so that our society won't turn into chaos. And so the police and the people who hold places of authority that keep the law, enforce the law, make the law, those are ordained by God. 
We get away from that and we get ourselves in a world of hurt. Some people would prefer then not to see Jesus as he is. And uh, they want a watered-down version. And the result is a Christ-like culture. Christless culture. So when Jesus asked this question, let's get into what second thing. Who do people say that I am? Guess what? In that first question, they're all wrong. They're all wrong. And when it comes to Jesus, don't hang your hat on people's opinions. Go to the Bible and find out what it says. Don't... Don't hang your hat on your own preferences. Go to the Bible and find out what it teaches. So we see that. Beyond the Christ, the popular culture then, there's a second view I want you to see. Jesus asked us to consider, asked those guys to think about. He says, and this is the Christ, the biblical record, or the biblical Jesus. He says, you told me what they, they think, but what do you, who do you say that I am? Who do you personally say that I, Jesus, am? I've spent two and a half years with you. Who do you say that I am? And here we have Peter's light bulb moment. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. Peter didn't come up with that on his own. You look at the other Gospels. Mark's Gospel is sort of cut and dried. He gives it in a compressed form, but the other Gospels say a little bit more. Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, this has come from God himself. He's taught you that I am the Christ. And so Peter is correct. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Mark doesn't give him an attaboy here. Jesus doesn't pat him on the back. He just says, don't tell anybody. Why in the world would he say that? Well, we're going to find out. One thing is true. Peter had correctly identified Jesus is the Christ. So this is a good thing, and it's from God. Mark wants us to see that Peter has just received a little bit of vision. He's like the, he's like the blind guy who had his first touch. And he sees, like, he sees men like trees walking around. Well, Peter, Peter's vision is there. It's just distorted as well as the rest of the, the disciples. Things are still fuzzy, but he does know that Jesus is the one. Peter got the title right, but the question is, what kind of Messiah, what kind of Christ was in Peter's mind, and what kind of Christ did Jesus know himself to be? What does Peter have in mind? Peter and Jesus' views here about what Christ and what Messiah is, which is the same thing, it just means anointed, their views were, were totally different. What does Peter think? Well, he, he's, uh, he thinks he's going he's gonna to be the Messiah and the rest of the disciples and all the culture. This guy is going to be an earthly figure. He's a political hero who's going to come and he's going to sweep away the, the Romans and everybody who's the enemy of Israel, and he's going to bring peace and tranquility to the people. And he's going to do it with military force. And the thing is, Jesus is not going to be that conquering military hero with force. He's going to, and this Peter can't take in, we're going to see next week, he's going to go to the cross. This Messiah is going to die for the sins of the world. He's going to die for our sins. And he's going to do it in the most unusual way that reflects the wisdom of God. Can I just say that, that such a discovery <laughs> could be the same for us? That the Christ of the Bible might just be the Jesus you never knew? You see, I've been a Christian all my life. Well, we're all on a journey. We're all on the way. And that, that phraseology, on the way, is a term for discipleship. We're all on the way. If we have started out on the journey to know Jesus, guess what? You can know Jesus more. For Peter, it would, would require a gradual healing. And you see, it's possible to be a disciple, a genuine follower of Jesus, and still have a fuzzy understanding of who he really is. And we want to allow for that. Because sometimes we think we've already arrived and nobody can teach us anything. 
Well, that kind of thinking is not going to bring you to maturity, right? And that's where we want to be. And so for Peter, it would require what? A gradual healing. He needed a second touch from Jesus, just like that blind man did. So that his eyes would be opened, and he and the rest of the disciples would see everything clearly. That wouldn't happen, by the way, until Jesus had died and he had rose from the dead. And at that point, everything kind of came into view, didn't it? Ah, oh. But up until then, they were totally confused. I'm glad I didn't live in that era. We, we have the privilege of looking back with the Gospels in hand to see what they couldn't see. And yet so often we, we can't see ourselves in some ways. The danger is to think that we already know him fully. But I got to think about that can't be right. Because what does Paul say? He says, I want to know him. I want, that's future. In Philippians 3, he says, I want to know him. Not that I already know him. I want to know him. Is that the way you think? I want to know him. I have a passion every day to get up and to know Jesus better than I did yesterday. And so as, as we think about our church in our culture, we desperately need a touch, a healing touch from Jesus. You know, the thing about it is just like the Lord corrects our vision incrementally, we can lose our vision incrementally, gradually, and not even know it. You know how, how it is when, uh, when, you, when you don't know you need glasses, and you never had glasses maybe? And somebody says, go to the eye doctor, and your eyes get checked out, and you put on glass, and you're going, oh, I didn't know what I was missing. I can see now. That can happen for us spiritually. When we put on the glasses that the Bible provides for us. So how do we receive this this touch of insight? That's really the question is, and how do we get this touch? And Jesus tells us, I think, in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Let me just listen. I didn't put this up on the the overhead, but listen to this. John 12, 20 through 26, Jesus says this, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. I like what John Piper said about that. He says, hating your life in this world means that you will choose to do things that look foolish in the world. You will deny yourself things and take risks and embrace the path of suffering for the sake of love. This, Jesus says, will lead to eternal life not death. In that whole passage in chapter 12, guess what? The people who came to to talk to the disciples and Jesus and see Jesus, they said to the disciples, sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And I'm kind of wondering if the the culture is asking that from us. Church, we want to see Jesus, but nobody's showing him to us. Because if they saw the real Jesus, they would fall in love with him. So let's look at this at the the end. I just want to kind of give some observations, let let, let that sink in. How how Jesus corrects our spiritual vision. Because remember, we don't correct our own spiritual vision. That has to come from above. Everything that we receive, we receive from him, right? It can only be received if God gives it to you but how do you receive it? Well, when we embrace the biblical Jesus, guess what? He will clear up our own vision and allow us to see as he sees. Not as we see, but as he sees. And so let me give you some observations here. And the first one is Jesus continues to walk among his church, which includes our own, by the way. His presence means he always knows our spiritual Condition. He knows your spiritual condition. He's no, he knows my spiritual condition. And I take that from, from the letter to the Revelation, the end of the book, end of the Bible, the book of Revelation. 
John has this vision of the crucified, uh, risen Lord. And he is uh, describing the Son of Man in that vision. And it says he walks among the lampstands. That's the churches. He walks among the churches. See, do you believe Jesus is walking among us this morning? His presence is here. You don't see him, but he's here by his Spirit. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that he, he really sees our spiritual condition? If that's really true, what do we need to do about that? And then John says there in that passage in Revelation 1, 14, and also in verse, chapter 19, verse 12, he said, he has eyes like a flame of fire. Which is another way of saying he penetra- his eyes are penetrating. He can see into our soul and our spirit to see us as we are. Nothing is hidden from God. We might hide it from each other, might try to hide it from ourselves, but God sees it. God knows. Jesus continues to walk, and his presence means he always knows our spiritual condition. Here's a second thing. Jesus' penetrating gaze both purifies the conscience and kindles the affections. Jesus' penetrating gaze both purifies the conscience and kindles the affections. I thought of this. Um, Think about the woman who was caught in adultery. I think it's in John 8. That woman in the adultery, caught in adultery, they bring her in, they throw her down on the ground, I think, I just picture this, and all the people who were accusing her gather around her because they're going to stone her to death. And Jesus steps in, he stoops down, he writes something in the dirt, and he, and he says, and I forgot exactly how it goes, the one who's, who has never sinned, how is throw the first stone. You, you throw the first stone. And it said, from the oldest to the youngest, they walked away. Because they knew their lives weren't what they needed to be. So Jesus, you see his compassion toward this woman who was caught in her sin. And we're talking about the eyes of Jesus here. How does Jesus see? Compassion. But he also says to the woman, go and sin no more. No compromise. I'll tell you the truth. I love you. But your sin is unacceptable. Bring it to me. He says, go and sin no more. So Jesus penetrates our lives. He looks with that gaze and he purifies our conscience so that our conscience doesn't accuse us and hold us and call us guilty when when he has declared us clean and righteous in his sight if we're in him. And he kindles our affections. He causes us to love him more when our heart is clean and we see him as he is. And then the third one, recovering our sight means we will not be afraid to say what he sees. Recovering our sight means we will not be afraid to say what he sees. Here's one of the things I just think. It's just, you can tell me whether you think it's right or not. But sometimes I think we're more afraid to be crucified than, being, than, than die, die to the things that, that we need to die to. The church is afraid to be crucified than, than, than tell the truth as Jesus sees it. Recent example. What I'm talking about is, is the all-time, the 12-time all-time American swimmer, Riley Gaines. She has five SEC titles to her credit while she was at the University of Kentucky. And her entire life was changed recently when she was forced to share a locker room and then compete against this biological male, Leah Thomas, at the 2022 a Women's Swimming Championship. So they get there and they swim and they tie and the trophy is given to the, to the, the biological male. Because they've only got one. And then last, I think a week before last, because of her perspective, of that this is, she spoke out against this. Uh, Riley Gaines, speaking out against the inequities that um, kind of pushed, the, pushed Leah Thomas and the transgender agenda. Just, just as I say, over a week ago, she was physically attacked. 
She's paying a price for telling the truth. And here's what she said. I feel like we're living in a godless society. I feel like we're in this battle of really spiritual warfare. It's no longer good or bad or right or wrong. This is like moral moral versus evil. So you got to understand, I hope you can see, we're living in a time when we have to see Jesus as he is and not be afraid to tell people who he is and stand for the things he stands for, value the things he values, champion the things he champions. Church, it's up to us in every other church who claims to be Christian. Here's what Jesus said. He wanted the perspective of what Jesus sees this as. He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And some of you may not like what I'm teaching this morning, but I'm just teaching you the Bible. This is not my opinion. So if you claim to follow Jesus, you'll open the book and you'll go, I will submit my perspectives to the scriptures. The only reliable guide to faith and practice. But that's just one example. I could give you bunches more, and you probably could too. But the thing is, when we're afraid to stand for the things Jesus stands for, things will only get worse. Let's be the church, church. Let's stand up, as the song says, for Jesus. So how do you end this? It's not negative. This is positive. This is our day. This is our opportunity. I I used to think when I was younger, you know, when I was the age I am now, where I would be. And I had never imagined the culture would be like it is now. But if you if you think about it, you're living in this age too. And this is your prime opportunity to bring glory to God. And so I wanted to kind of give us a, um, how do you finish this this up? And uh, it's really, because I said, you can't change this about yourself on your own. What do you do? You ask God to change your heart. And so we look at a prayer I want us to pray that Paul prayed for the Ephesians. I want us to stand up and let me just pray it for us as we go. Pray. You bow your head and close your eyes and pray this prayer with me with, with a sincere heart. So Paul says to those Ephesians, and he, he, he prays, he says, he prays at the God, and I pray God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that you would give us all the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you, Jesus that you would give us the eyes that we need to have, that our hearts, the eyes of our heart would be enlightened, that we can see the hope of our calling, and that we would be people who would be on track for you. Father, do this in the name of Jesus. Heal us, we pray, our vision, Lord. Heal it in Jesus' name. Amen.